not as crazy as it might sound, because uh, whether I was working uh, or am working as a lawyer or a poet, I am an advocate. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of others without an opportunity to be heard. Uh, at that time and place, they happened to be uh, the people in the community of Chelsea and beyond. Um, and now, if anything, the spectrum is even broader than that, right? because it's national or it's international. Um, but I'm still speaking on behalf of immigrants, I'm still speaking on behalf of um, uh, the, uh, the most damned, the most despised, the most condemned people in, in our society and, and beyond. And I feel a compulsion to do so. Most people, again, would not regard what a poet does to be anything remotely like what a lawyer does. In fact, the commonality is a language. And a lawyer must use language very, very precisely. If you put a, a word in the wrong place in a will, that will could be invalidated. And that's something that I seek to do as a poet. My, my diction, my choice of words is as precise as I can make it. Uh, the images that I use, the, the evocation of the senses, again, relies upon a certain exactitude. You have to get it right. Um, you have to pay close attention. You have to be a good listener. Um, you can put yourself in the poem, but don't put yourself in the center of the poem, such that you become the hero of the poem. That's not the idea. The alternative is silence. The alternative is silence. The people that I represented in Chelsea, and for that matter, the people I've represented in other poems, um, especially if they happen to be Spanish-speaking, especially if they happen to be immigrant. Um, they are consigned to silence and oblivion in this society. The alternative is unthinkable, and so I speak. The Academy, uh, which is given you know, to be uh, bureaucratic and, and authoritarian in the first place, very naturally reinforces the status quo, very naturally reinforces whatever the predominant aesthetic happens to be. Um, and in fact, the predominant aesthetic uh, in poetry, you won't be surprised to hear, uh, marginalizes or excludes uh, poetry of social or political content. Uh, it always has, but now it has become more pronounced, especially uh, since the end of the Second World War with the advent of uh, McCarthyism. When did this uh, taken for granted reality uh, cement itself? You know, when, when did it become a given that political poetry was an oxymoron? Because at one time, it was an accepted part of the spectrum when it came to poetry in this country. In the 1930s, you can see it everywhere. Um, and many of them, indeed, advocates, many of them writing in the Whitman tradition, um, and, and too many to name. Uh, and yet many of them were wiped out uh, of the historical record and wiped out of the academy. We don't read them anymore, precisely because of the advent of the Cold War McCarthyism. It's important to remember we have a voice. And um, there are so many others who don't. Most people don't. Um, and there are writers uh, who have uh, voices that are, in fact, suppressed. And that happens in other countries, and guess what? It happens here, too. Here in the United States, from our position of relative safety, it's important to bear in mind that we must oppose state violence in this country as well. Otherwise, we're not being consistent. And, and we lose credibility when we point fingers at other governments and other peoples far away. Um, and I'm speaking in terms of what is happening in this country with respect to police violence against people of color. Um, and we're well aware um, of what's happening. 
I don't have to tell you what's happening. But I want to see more poets and more writers speaking out against the state violence that's happening in this country right now, police violence against people of color.